time with Herman and Sharon. Here we go. Here we Let's go. We've got company care of this morning. This, yeah. this short guy right next to me, R.V. Brown. Mm. Yeah. He is <laughs> going to give a challenge to everyone watching. That's my wife right over there. Yeah. 60 yeah. years together. Yeah. And this guy right here has been married how many years? 42 years. 42. Okay, get, give me an idea how big uh, your a family is. It's, I'm 16th of 17 children. And what we also have here today, this is what we call a reverse Oreo. We in the middle. Today. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna right. have a great time. Yes, 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 we are. That's right. And you and, and and you you have lost how many pounds? Forty two pounds. And the doctor put you on what kind of diet? A racial diet. A racial diet. He told me to cut out all the white stuff and I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, we got I told I told him he could be a stand-up comedian if he yes, wants to. He could. But let me tell you, God's got a call on his life that mm. is absolutely mm. phenomenal. Mm. So good to have you. Yes, I had so good you to be have here. you walk out of the house with me. All right, good deal. In, in, fa in fact, a lot of people probably couldn't see the picture behind us. Mm -hmm. But if you couldn't see the picture, take a look. This is what the picture is right yep. there. There it is. Uh, the president and founder of this network mm -hmm. sat down one day and had prayer with. Donald J. Trump, mm. and 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 I understand that that's a regular regular thing that happens in the White House all the time. That's good. Kind they of head. Uh, Paula White has really been a kind of a mm -hmm. constant in that particular area. And I'm gonna ask them to just give me. I want seven minutes with him. That's what you. What are you gonna do with that? I want seven minutes to pray. I don't need to. I don't need no conversation. I need him on his knees with me. Seven minutes. Everything in that Bible is threes and seven. If we do it seven minutes, and then I'm asking seven days, I want you to pray for seven minutes, and you watch what God would do. See, there's Amen. power in prayer. Mm -hmm. If we just get in the habit of praying, my father could not read anything, but he knew how to pray. And every night I would hear my mom and daddy praying together, and they would call all 17 children's name in order, and every time she'd get to my name, I would clog my ears up, because I wanted to be bad like those kids down the street. <laughs> and so my mama said, Lord, you chastise or you have to do what you want to do. I'm right where my mama prayed. The day I got saved, November 18, 1977, I called my mama 42 miles away. She said, tell me what God has done in your life. God already lived. Mary, your prayers have been answered. So there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. It may take a while for the answer to get there, but the answer is on the way. RV reminded me last time we were together yes. in Colorado. 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 And, and, and I, I, let, me just, let me just, uh, uh, as quickly as I can, give you a little background, because this guy is absolutely amazing. Uh, R.V. Brown is the founder and president of Outreach to America Youth Incorporated. He has carried the gospel message to 47 countries and 47 states, speaking and sharing uh, his message all over the place, prisons, retreats, camps, conferences, uh, college campuses. He received his bachelor B.S. degree from South Carolina State University, where he played football all four years. All four years. Oh, four years. That's I'm, good. And graduated in four years. Graduated in four years with my degree. A lot of people don't graduate, but I had to go to class because my mama told me, don't make me come down there and find you not doing your work in school. Can you, can you relate? How are the athletes, when you talk to them, are, you know, we get the idea sometimes that they're, they're obstinate about, about prayer and, and what is happening in America and that, that, that they're coming against what America was founded on? Well, a lot of them, because they haven't heard, they don't understand, but when, when I get a chance to speak to them, and, and I want to know, God has blessed me. I have presented the gospel to all 32 NFL teams. I've shared the gospel to all the teams because I'm neutral. You know, when I come in, it's all about God. Yeah. Not about who win this football game, and you can win every football game and lose your soul. What have you gained? Nothing, mm -hmm. but if you got Jesus, losing the game may hurt, but you know what? You always find comfort in Jesus Christ. So I want these young men to be able to look at a man that's an athlete that looks like them, that act like them, that sound like them, and let them know it's okay to love Jesus. It's okay to pray. It's okay to get on your knees and pray. See, this is what is not happening right now. We're not being told, these young men be told, you can pray. It's okay to pray. It's all right to pray. Not only to pray, but believe in who you're praying to. That's the key. A lot of times we pray, but do we really believe? See, God has an expectation of me, and I got one of him. So he expects me to pray, and I expect him to answer the prayer. It may not come when I want it, but it's always there. There's no such thing as unanswered prayer. The prayer, the answer is coming. You just got to be patient and wait on it. I waited for 32 years, 
and God called me in the ministry. So in the last 39 years of my life, I've been in the ministry full time. I haven't been on anybody's payroll but God. I've lived totally by faith. When I started this thing in 85, they said, there's no such thing as an African-American evangelist. It's not been done. It won't be done in America. This can't be done. It will never been done. I hadn't heard one yet. It said, watch. But watch what God has done. God has carried me all the way around the world. God, I just got back not too long ago from China preaching in a communist country. Good God Almighty. Prayer <laughs> is the power. And if we realize the power that's in prayer, and you know, most people say every football team, every team has to have an MVP. We know what, what does MVP stand for, huh? Most valuable person. No, I changed that. Oh, okay. <laughs> you must value the presence of God. Wow. See, a lot of times you ask people to pray, they won't pray because they haven't been in the presence of God. See, when you pray, you get in the presence of God. When I pray, I expect every angel to listen to what I'm saying. When I get up at 4.30 every morning and say, God, here I am, let's talk. And when I start praying, I think all the angels in heaven say, shh, shh quiet, RV talking right now, let's listen. And you can't tell me they don't. So I believe I got God's ear. Wow. And David said in Psalm 31, 1 and 2, oh Lord, indeed, let me put my trust in you. Let me never be ashamed of you, God. And God, he said, when I begin to pray, God, bow your ear down to me. Let me hear. So when I pray, God, listen to me. And then he said, okay, Angel Sam, go get his blessing. Angel Joe, go answer that prayer. He prayed last year. The prayer is coming and the answers is coming because I believe in who am I talking to and I believe that God is hearing what I say and he's going to act. See, prayer is God's heartbeat. When I read my Bible this morning, Psalm 6, David is talking about prayer. I read a part of verse, I pray that verse right back to God. God want to hear his word coming back to him from his son. I am his son. I'm his favorite son. I don't know about you, <laughs> Sam, but I'm his favorite son. I believe I'm his favorite child. And that's why prayer is so important to me because I heard my mom and dad do it on a regular basis. And the last three of those 17 kids are boys. And I'm in the middle of those two boys. And I asked my oldest, I said, with me, Tony and Coz is so bad that they had to pray like that. They said, no, that's what they always did. Now, my father couldn't read one word, but he knew how to get in touch with God. Praise and he God. taught me how to love because I saw him love my mom. When I married my wife 42 years ago, I told her, I said, now, if you're not ready to stay in this with me, don't get married to me because you ain't going nowhere. I got your social security card. Yeah. If you leave me, I'll find you. I'll find you and make sure the bed big enough for me and you to get in because I'm coming. Because my father and mother stayed together, stayed together, worked it out. And that's what we got to have today. If family will pray together, and I want you to listen to this word, prayer, and look at the word family. The word family stands for father, acknowledge the mother, influence the life of the young. So if the father's lining up, if the father start coming to church, if the father start praying, if the father start doing that, guess what? It's going to influence the mom and the children. That's what we're missing today. Father, the influence of fathers in the lives of children, influence of father life in the home. And when we do that, we're going to see prayers answered and we're going to see this nation go back to where it's supposed to be. This nation was founded on prayer. Everybody who came here made it on prayer. Even the slaves came here. They were praying, God, don't let me die till I get over there. Yeah, listen to their of, songs. Right. Yeah. A lot of them died because yeah. they were stacked. A lot of them died. So the ones that made it, made it on a prayer. Yeah. So this whole nation is surrounded with prayer yeah. until we get back and start believing in prayer and using prayer as a tool to read out, read, meet our means. Church, if I want to challenge the church, Herman, if the church would do what it's supposed to, it's number one job is to pray. Number two job is the gospel. Number three job is to witness to the poor. Number three job is get yourself out of the church and get in the community. Boy, we right. want we want to stay in the church. We want to become. I'm an uncomfortable church, church, Christian, excuse me, because I'm, I'm so uncomfortable that I got to talk about Jesus. <laughs> See, people that's, that's comfortable with Christian, they have no power because they're not using it. See, we don't realize that book right here called the Bible, how much power is in this book. Mm -hmm. You ever seen your Bible talk? You ever heard your Bible talk? Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Read me, read me, read me. Come here, spend time with me. Talk to me. I want to spend time. This is God's heartbeat. This is God's heartbeat. And this book That's talks great. to you. This is his word. This is his God breathes. And the book that we're talking about later on, every word in that book is God breathes. Every word in that book is a prayer. 365 so, prayers. 365 prayers. All day long. We were in Atlanta, Georgia. To the, to, the next, to the championship game for the uh, Atlanta Falcons and the Green Bay Packers. My godson plays for the Packers. And my wife don't get up there. I'm up at 4.30, so she would not let me turn the lights on, so I had to get out of the room. So I go to the 37th floor of this hotel. They got a green room out there. So I go out the room because the, the restaurant is open to 6 to feed you, so it's just 4.35. So I go outside, and I pray, I'm praying. And next thing I know, I find myself on my knees. Now, I'm getting ready to get them operated on. 
get both of them uh, operate on. I find myself on my knees, Herman, that for I don't know how long I've been praying, but my shirt was soaking wet. I done prayed so long and cry. And David said, my bed swim, my, my couch swimming with my tears. And I got up off my knees and sitting down in this chair and I'm asking myself, well, why am I crying, God? Why I was on my knees, my knees are hurting so bad. And God said, I'm commissioning you to pray for this nation for a year commission. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. When is the last time in your lifetime you ever heard anybody say they was commissioned to do anything? Never. I ain't never heard anybody say, I was called to do this. God told me to do this. But commission. See, when you're commissioned to do something, you don't have a choice. See, when, when God called you to do something, you can change your mind. But when I said, I'm commissioning you to do this, you got to change. When Paul got saved on the, on, on the road to Damascus, that boy was commissioned to carry the gospel to who? The kings. And he told uh, Ananias, I've called him. He's going to present me to kings and queens. He's going to do everything. Paul didn't have no choice. John the Baptist was born without a choice. He's the only man who was born without a choice. John the Baptist had one job, deliver Jesus, open the door for Jesus. We got one job, Paul. One job, Paul said, I got one job, and I'm Paul to tell the world that Jesus Christ is coming and pray. We don't pray enough. We don't believe in prayer. We pray, but do who, who do we? This is how America prays. Give me, give me, give me, give me, yeah. give me, give me, give me. Why not go to God and say, God, I got a house. I got two pieces of bread. I got two dollars in the bank. I got a car. Why not thank God? See, if we begin to thank God like we're supposed to, being in 47 countries and being in a country where there's hardly no food, you understand when you come back home, you better say your grace. See, a lot of people when they eat, they don't even say the grace. Just when you go out to eat, look in the restaurant and see how many people say the grace. Do like I do. I get in the middle of the restaurant and say, God, I ask that you bless this food. And all the people that didn't pray, let them know they should have prayed for this food. Bless their food. Why? Because not because I'm a big person. I just believe the world needs to hear somebody stand up and not afraid. I'm not afraid to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm not afraid to pray. You know, somebody said, well, I want you to pray. Let's do it right now. Yeah. In the store. Yeah, right here. Why? Because I might get on and forget about it. Mm -hmm. See? So when your person said, will you pray for me? Do it right then. Yeah. So at least at one time, you know you prayed for that person yeah. at least one time. So you do right. this in prison. In prison. Okay, when you step on that platform, you look out over that mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. Are they receiving what you're oh, saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just preached in the prison on the word if. Say if. If you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, he can shorten your sin. If you trust him, he can save your soul. If you believe in him. If, 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 if. If you just believe in who I'm telling you about tonight. I say, you think you guys are bad? Let me tell you about some bad. Let me tell you about four bad men in that Bible. The first bad man was Moses. Moses was what? A murderer. And God used him. Abraham was a liar and an adulterer. God used him, but they repented. David was a murderer and an adulterer. He repented. Peter cursed God to his faith, and God used him. Why? Because once you repent and don't go back, that's where your power comes in. But if you repent and keep going the same thing over and over, you can't find no freedom in that. See, when I repented 42 years ago and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord, I said, I ain't going back to being the same old man. And as I was telling Linda earlier, when somebody said, well, share your testimony with us. Here's my testimony. I was going to hell. What's worse than that? What did you do before you got saved? Going to hell. Nothing else matters. I, what I did 42 years ago can't help you there. Only what's going to help you is what I'm getting ready to tell you today. Today, Jesus Christ said, if you pray today, you find this freedom. See, I'm free. I'm not tied to any denomination. I'm not tied to anything but the hem of Jesus' garment. Remember that woman said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. What I did 42 years ago, I touched the heel of this word, and I've been healed. I had a stroke. They gave me one hour to live. I had this thing called CPK. I came out the jungle, de dehydrated, my muscles eating itself, clog up my kidney. My kidneys function 5%. They said, you ain't gonna make it. Look at me. That was June of 2012. Do I look like I am dead? Do I look like I'm alive? I had a stroke. Do I look like I had a stroke on this side? God, if you pray, when that lady said, you got one hour to live, that you know, because my blood pressure was 280 over 160. Wow. What did you have? Uh, CPK. Look up CPK. It's the thing when the muscle eats itself and it went into my kidneys and blocked it up and it would raise my blood pressure up. I told that lady, go find me a Bible. That lady found me a Bible. I laid on that table and operated and held that Bible up and said, in the name of Jesus. This book says, if I trust you and I pray in your name, Jesus, I'll be here. In an hour and a half, that blood pressure come back down. They told me, don't lift no weight. Look at me now. 
Seven years later, look at me now. Do I look like I had a stroke? Do I look like I'm miserable? That's why I try to tell men, if you just trust this God named Jesus, if you just believe in this man, you won't be miserable. I'm tired of traveling around this country, preaching in church, seeing no prune faced Christian sitting in church. <laughs> we have right. something to be happy about. See, when yeah. you lost, you got a fast faith. When you got Jesus, man, it's time to get excited. Yeah. Um, it's That's time right. to get excited. Sure. We need some excitement back in there. And my job is a commission to pray, is to get the church to pray and then go out there and tell somebody with Jesus with a smile on your face. Right. Nah, well, you know, I'm not sure about that. What? If you say if you accept the Christ, then be a bold with it. Yeah. Hebrews 13, 6, and we can boldly go to the throne of this one because the Lord is our helper and we don't have to fear what no man should say under us or do under us. I don't fear no man, not because I'm a big guy. It's because I serve a big God. And I read about Job this morning and Job started talking about that. He had Job said, to, Satan said, I want Job. I want Job. He said, but you can't get him. He said, no, I can't get him because on every side of it, you got a hedge around him. But if you take that hedge down, I'll make him curse you. God said, okay, now watch what God does. God said, I'm going to give you permission to go out there, but you better not touch your soul. That means God is still in control and in authority. And if you read the Bible and take the authority of the Bible and use it on Satan, he can't defeat you. See, we get defeated because we don't take God at his word. See, I believe I got one problem with the Bible, Herman and Sharon. I got one problem that I believe everything from Genesis to Revelation. And the first, the first statement in the Bible, in the beginning, God created it, right? The last word in the Bible is amen. God created it, amen. That's it. <laughs> Everything created, amen. That's amen. it. The, the book ends is amen, and he created it. Look at us. He created us to do what? To serve God. If we understand that through prayer, we can get in touch with God. He's listening. Every morning, every time you pray, if you really know him, he's listening to you. But if you ain't saved, you don't know Jesus Christ, your prayer going to a rick, 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 bang, 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 it's bouncing up and down. It ain't going nowhere. But if you say, God, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, I believe in you, I trust you, I'm praying and asking you to save my soul, the ceiling opens up. And you know, just like he said, I'll pull you out of blessing. But you have rumors here, watch what he said. He said, I dare you to test me. You look at Malachi, he said, I dare you to test me. RV, I dare you to pray and test me and see if I'll do it. Trust me. I pray, I do what I'm supposed to do. If I'm living right, God's got to bless me. People realize, I say, why are you like I said, because God has no choice but to bless me. They said, why is that? I love his son, Jesus. I love my wife. I'm faithful to my wife. I'm faithful to the word. I'm faithful to love my grandchildren. I'm faithful to do what God called me to do. So I got to be blessed. Now, how can I tell people around this world about Jesus if they look at me and they see me sad? If I'm sitting there saying, well, you know, God can do this, and, you know, they wouldn't want to believe, but when they see me, I want them to see a picture. I'm an image of what God looks like. I'm an image of the light that's inside me. What are you doing, Daddy? What are you reflecting to your family that as a prayer man are you reflecting? My daddy was a praying man. He went to church every Sunday. Wow. Couldn't read nothing. He's a deacon in the church. Stand up and pray. Couldn't read nothing. You put Ann in front of him, couldn't understand it. But he knew how to get in touch with God. And he taught me how to love God, how to love my wife, because I saw him love my mama. I saw him be with my mama. I saw him never leave my mom till he passed on. That's what young men, and that's what men are missing today, and wives are missing, because they don't have that male figure. And the world is trying to say men are not obsolete. No, the anchor is Jesus. The anchor came through Jesus. Do you yeah. tell athletes? Oh, yeah that are about to be married or going to get these big contracts, what do you say? I tell those guys, if you trust God, and there's one young man that I'm working with right now, and I don't want to say his name right now because, you know, but I got him where he's in church now. I got him where he's praying now. I, he said, he asked me, he said, well, Papa RV, what do you want for Christmas? I said, most people would say a car, and I said, put a ring on her finger. So now they're getting married next spring. I said, now, you start reading the word. So now when I meet with him, every time I meet with a young man, I give him scriptures. See, I can tell you a whole lot of things, Herman Shem, but if I don't say the word, if I don't put something in your hand for you to take with you, then what have I said? You've forgotten 90% of what I said by the time you got through. But if you got these scriptures to refer back, I never meet with a young man or a couple without putting scriptures in their hand because the word is the only thing going to help you grow. So this young man is growing. I just took him to my special prayer spot. On the ocean, I got a place where I pray. I, I meet God on right on that car. But I don't want to say because everybody be trying to find out when I'm there. <laughs> but I took him there. I said, take your shoes off. 
I said, now you sitting on holy ground right now. Take your shoes off, son. Mm -hmm. So he took his shoes. I said, now stump them shells. He started stumping the feet. I said, now you stumping all your past under your feet, son. When you walk away from here today, everything behind you, don't bring it up. Don't talk about it no more. You've been blood washed. Your blood clean. So what happened? Now live that way, son. If you live that way, God gonna bless you. But it all comes back to praying. What comments do people say when they start reading that? Well, 360, I mean, the prayers are some long, some short. Every conceivable prayer. Now, when I gave you that book, I, hadn't, I didn't have this. What this is right here is a little tab. I went, I worked with Clemson this last football year. Now, all you Alabama fans, <laughs> I worked with Clemson for the last four years. I want to work with Alabama this year, but they need to let me. So I go to celebrate the national championship when I'm on my way back down the road and I just released the book and, and God says it's incomplete because you didn't tell him what to do with it. So what do you mean God? So I pull off on the, on the uh, rest area right when you cross the line from South Carolina into Georgia and I said, I said, okay God, what are you saying? So I wrote this down and it's this, what this little slip is telling you how to read the book. If you read for 15 days, if you read 20 pages, you finish the book in 30 days. If you read 10 pages, you finish it in 30 days. So this is not a book to sit around and read one or two little prayers. I, I wish I had put it close together, but I separated it. Read 10 pages a day. For 30 days, the book is finished. Now you give it to somebody else. Now a new habit is formed. See, most people don't have no habit. See, I get up at 4.30. I don't need no long time. That's my time with God. Nobody better not call me at 4.30 because that's my quiet time with God. And that's me and his time. See, then it said, then I find out in that prayer time, Luke 1, 37 says, is there anything too hard? So if I'm praying, I got a situation I'm praying about, God is going to answer because I expect him. When I get up off my knees, I expect the answer to come. See, when we pray, we, we go try to do what we just told God to do. Get out of God's way. Let him answer the prayer. We get our prayers shortened because we spend too much time trying to answer to ourselves. Get out of God's way. God don't need our help. God is capable of doing it all, and that's what this little slip said. And on, the, on that is my, is my office. So if churches will call me, I'll come and explain to them what commission to pray is all about. When you wrote a book like that, I mean, where did you get the inspiration? What does your schedule look like? Well, I tell you what, on page 307, look on page 307 right quick. On page 307, and I want, when you get your copy book, you can go to this page too. 307. You on 307? Oh, yes. I was in about 32 goodness, cities. Goodness gracious. Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee. I was in all those states, in all those little cities. Every, every one of these books, every, every day I wrote, I tell you what city I was in when I wrote that. And God commissioned me to pray. And I'm, this is not a book. This is prayer. I, I don't call this, this is prayer. Every word in here has been breathed on by God. So my uh, wife, roommate from college, I just got inducted into my Hall of Fame in my high school. How many Hall of Fames are you in? Four. I'm in four Hall of Fames. Come on, Brian, work for me. December the 18th, 1977, I accepted Jesus Christ. I'm in the Hall of Faith. Okay? Mm -hmm. 2003, I go into Fellowship of Christian Christianized Hall of Fame in Kansas City, Missouri. 2012, I'm inducted into my college hall of fame at South Carolina State. And then uh, wow. two weeks, three weeks ago, I was inducted into my hall of fame in my high school. Wow. High school. Mm -hmm. And the, the guy that did it, he went back at 50 years and found an article that I didn't know exists. And it says, Safety R.V. Brown made history. Airport has his first winning season. He intercepted the pass and ran it back 44 yards for a touchdown. And that Cecile, our first winning season, the school was like three or four years old. I had no idea that was that. I had no idea I had made history. See, I made history in my family because when I got saved, nobody else was saved. They just went to church and they oh, believed really? in God. They didn't have a relationship. So in 20 years, all my brothers and my mom and daddy got saved. All my wife, brothers and sisters got saved because one person got saved and got turned on to prayer because I saw my, now my daddy understood I love Jesus, that she would get to heaven. God would have taken him because that's all he could do. But I wanted to make sure he knew Jesus. Amen. And here, here it is, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet for a minute. In 1980, I'm living in Chattanooga, Tennessee, teaching and coaching. My wife and I teaching and coaching. God wakes me up and said, you need to go home in June. You need to make sure your dad and mama know Jesus like you know Jesus. So I prayed. March, April, May, June, I get home. I take my daddy. 
who was 102 at this time, oh into the bedroom. And I said, now, Daddy, I had to be real careful how I said this. I said, Daddy, if you die right now, would you go to heaven? And I had to be real quiet when I said, hell, you don't curse at my mama's house. You knock your head off. So I said, he said, well, baby, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I said, no, Daddy, between heaven and hell. He said, what I need to do, baby, I took my 102-year-old dad, I said, get on your knees, Daddy. And I led my father to the Lord the way the Bible says to be led to the Lord. Then I turned to my Jehovah Witness mama at that time and said, now, mama, that thing you in ain't going to get you there. You got to come do what Mr. Willie did because she called my daddy. So my mama comes over here and get beside my daddy, accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And I preached my daddy's funeral six months to the day. And I ain't shed one tear because I told him I'm going to see him again. I said, now, oh, when you go to the funeral, people are screaming and hollering yeah. because they know they didn't do what they were supposed to do Amen. for him. That camera yeah. is yours right there. Oh, number two. Two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Uh, Share Christ with someone watching. Yeah. They didn't know they were going to hear this. Today could be the greatest day of your life. If you believe two things, you believe Jesus Christ came, you believe he died on that cross, he will save your soul. But you have to want that in your life. Romans 10, 9 said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13 said, whoever call on the name of Jesus shall be saved. All you have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. Come into my heart today, Jesus. I acknowledge you as my Savior today. And when you do that, you're in the, you're in the land book life. Nothing can erase that. Now you got to find a church where you can grow. Not a church hooping and hollering, running around, flipping over pews, but somebody <laughs> standing flat foot with Satan and said, you're defeated because of the Word of God. So I'm telling you today, the Word of God, this book is prayer. The prayer is the only thing that can change you. Now grow into what God would have you to do. I challenge you today to understand that you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship with the Bible, a relationship with him every single day of your life. I've done this for what? 42 years. December of 1980, I made a choice. I'm going to read my Bible every day. Wow. And I'm going to memorize one verse a week. That's 39 years. I don't have to have it in front of me because David said that word about hitting in my heart that I won't send you. That's what keeps me loving my wife because the word of God is hitting in my heart. Now, if you accept the Christ today, you've been hidden into the Lamb's book of life and your name is written. Now grow. Don't be a spiritual pygmy. Grow into a giant for Jesus Christ. And pastors, you listen today, you preach the gospel. Don't get up there saying them mammy pammy thing, them little quick thing. Ain't no quick fix. The only thing quick fix is Jesus can save Amen. you right now. And the quick fix is that you are now a child of God. If you accept the Christ today, now get on your knees, raise your hand and say, I'm a child of the kingdom of God, and ain't nothing can change. I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Wow. Amen. Mm. He's a preacher. I, I need him on for a week. He's commissioned. Ain't no problem. <laughs> you just tell me when you want to do it. Yeah, you know, the message that you've got, there is no such thing as racism. Nope. Isn't nope. that amazing? Nope. You know racism why? comes because you get off well, the beaten path. Listen, I grew up on a farm. The white kid lived over here and I lived over here. We played together every day. We just went to separate schools. Yeah. Uh -huh. And when we finally went to school together in the seventh grade, I'm eating out of his food plate. He eating out of my people said, what are y'all doing? I say, I'm eating his biscuit. That wouldn't look what it looked like I'm doing. They couldn't understand that relationship. We have See? to go. I know. We'll have him back. I yeah. promise. God bless you. I'm Bye -bye. on my way. <laughs>